stand together as we sing all hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing it out. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. For that with sanctus sacred gold we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Crown him King of kings and crown him Lord of all. Yes, he's the wonderful counselor, a mighty God. God with us. everything we have to give. God bless you. You may be seated. Hey, Charles, could I get you just to continue playing there for a few minutes? Could we bow our heads and close our eyes? Let's all uh, give thanks to God our Father for being Emmanuel, God with us in Christ. Oh, man, what a blessing that is. Father, as we listen to the words of that song, how true and how honored we are, Lord, that you would even, that you would even give us a thought, even, even more that you would uh, abide with us and abide in us and live through us. And so, Father, I pray that uh, for everybody that's in this place, everybody that's listening from a different place today or watching from a different place, God, that your Holy Spirit would abide with them where they are, settle on them in their place. And, Father, in your name, I pray, Lord, a blessing on them today to sense your manifest presence. You are here in our midst. You are there in their midst. What a wonderful God you are to not be limited by space, 
not be limited by, by time or boundaries of any kind. The things that limit any human being, the most powerful, the most influential, the most wealthy, the most famous, we're all limited. You have no limitations. So, Father, I pray you'll, you'll speak wisdom into our lives today through your word. I pray that our worship of you, Father, would be pleasing to you as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, God with us. In his name we pray, amen. Well, amen. What a great, great way to start this Lord's Day. As a matter of fact, I was um, thinking about uh, those of you that are joining us from a different place today remotely, and it, it reminded me in some ways of the scene in Acts chapter 12 when um, Simon Peter has been in prison for uh, proclaiming the gospel in Christ, and I mean, the intention, the implication there is that Herod intends to bring him out because it's Passover time. It sounds real familiar. It sounds a, lot, sounds a lot like what's going on when he brought Jesus out at the same time of year. And so he, he has full intentions of bringing out Simon Peter, but what's going on remotely, without really even Peter aware of it, is they're, the Christians are praying in the home of John Mark's mom and their family, and God's at work where... Simon Peter is, and he's at work right where they are, right there in the midst of every single one of them. And so he releases Simon Peter, and then as, as Peter leaves there and goes to the home, the Christians are gathered and praying, and uh, God's been at work all along, even though they didn't know what he was doing. They're just praying. I mean, they're doing it by faith. Isn't it great to experience God's presence no matter where we are, whether we feel like it or not, not based on our feelings. You know, that song that uh, we sang a few minutes ago, God With Us, it's in that musical God With Us, right? Don Moen, isn't he the one that wrote that? Okay, so real, real brief story about that that I always think of, or just about always, when we're singing something that comes from that. God used that uh, many, many years ago to just really... Um, manifest himself in various ways in in churches. It was just really something to watch. And um, so our, the church where I served presented that musical as well. It's called God With Us. And um, during one part of the song, toward the end of the, of the worship service, there's this place where it's just, it's just kind of different. So I don't know how to exp explain it except that when you're doing it in the right, I mean, when your hearts are in the right place, frame of mind, something, something happens. That's all I'm saying. And during that portion of the service where you're talking about, I can hear the brush of angels' wings, other, there, there's something that happens there. And in our choir, I didn't notice at the time, but later on, someone told me that we had a couple of ladies in the choir. And there was a balcony, and um, one of the ladies, had, she saw something in the balcony and it, the light was kind of doing something, and she thought, that looks like an angel. And she didn't say anything because she didn't want anybody to think she was crazy. But she looked at the lady that was next to her, and the lady's name was Dot. And she looked at the lady, and the lady looked at her, and they looked at each other about the same time. And the other lady said, I saw it too. Our worship pastor later on asked somebody in the main, Don Moen's main office, hey, let me ask you something. Has anybody been talking about, have you had any other churches report some weird stuff going on? You know, he didn't even know how to explain it. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, we hear that all the time. So while God's here, he's everywhere. You know, he's just, he's just everywhere. So, man, let's listen to him today. We're going to sing some more songs. We're going to dig into his word. I will encourage you to continue to be faithful with stewardship so you can still practice giving as we leave to one of the baskets or the app or mail it in, whatever it is. But please keep that in the forefront. We're not, we're not seeing it visually these days in our worship time, but, but please remain faithful as you have been in that area. And also, if you're watching online, we 
uh, have people that are watching too. They're a part of our church family. So interact with them. Let them know what prayer needs and prayer concerns you have. And you can say, you can say amen during a part of the service and we'll see it. Or you can say, oh, me during part of the service and we'll see that too. Whatever, you know, however God uh, moves your heart. So let's continue our worship. I love that song, God With Us, um, and I do hear so many things that churches have experienced. And you know, the Word of God says that, that He inhabits the praises of His people, and so we don't sing just for our benefit, but as we sing from our hearts and our mouths, it invites the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I was, Paul mentioned today, he said, man, I love the music, you always pick, and it, it's not me, I try to be obedient, and I try to stay out of God's way. Because uh, I can mess it up. But I love the songs today, and they always seem to be applicable for, for me and for others, that God is with us. He is with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And the songs that we're going to sing in this next set uh, simply are stating that he is there. Not only is he there, but he is a way maker. He's a chain breaker. And I want to tell you today that you are who God says you are, and that is you're a victor. You're an overcomer. And the greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And if we'll exercise that and walk in faith and walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will guide you and lead you and do things you never thought imagined you could imagine. And how blessed you will be and how much of a blessing you'll be to the others. Do you receive that today? Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to sing. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside Listen, there's a better life There's a better life Sing it If you got pain He's a pain taker Yes he is If you feel lost Search for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out by the same old fight. We've all run for things we know that just ain't right. Come on. There's a better life. There's a better life.
receive that today. Give him praise in this place.
today and celebrate that you are who he says you are he is for you and not against you that ought to make us smile and walk in victory doesn't it amen God wants to use you for something great this week he wants to use you to encourage somebody he's going to ordain your path this week with someone that needs encouraging that none someone needs praying for and for someone that needs for you and me to be the feet and the hands of Jesus and when we do that, he uses us to bless others. And man, how we are blessed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of, here it is, anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. Not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time
Confidence Church. Here we go. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. I know that He will make a way for me, and He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side with love and strength for. people shouted amen amen god bless you yes give him praise today he is amen. worthy amen you may be seated amen okay let's go ahead and take our bibles and find the old testament book of nehemiah and today we'll be reading from nehemiah chapter five here in just a few minutes when you think about a time maybe where you faced something that was really a tough situation and you thought you know what? I just don't think things could get any worse. But then they did. There was a mom, true story, a mother of eight in Darlington, Maryland, who was coming home from a neighbor's house one Saturday afternoon, and as she approached her home, she saw five of her youngest children all huddled together just outside the porch, and they were paying attention to something, but she just couldn't tell what it was. And so she tried to quietly slip up to see what had all of their attention, and what she saw made her mortified because right in the middle of those five little kids was a group of baby skunks. And the mother panicked, and all she could do was just scream, children, run! And sure enough, each child grabbed a skunk and ran in separate directions. And just when you think things maybe can't get any worse, I promise you, they really can. And that is what Nehemiah is facing in Nehemiah chapter 5. We'll read it in a few minutes, but I want to make some uh, observations first and just share some thoughts with you. One is really in the form of a promise. So here is our promise today. God has provided every resource to accomplish his will on the earth. Now, I know sometimes we pray that God will provide resources. We'll talk about that. But the promise is God has already provided every resource that we need to accomplish his will on the earth. Now, as a church family, here's what that looks like during these days. Um, we're in the midst of about, well, about two-thirds of the way through a season of 21 days where we're asking our church family to take time in fasting and prayer. As a church family, we're praying for three things. We're praying Now, as individuals, uh, we're encouraging one another to pray for just one thing. So in our family, I'm praying and focusing on one thing during these days. Paige has a one thing. They're not the same thing. Um, I'll just share with you, we're already seeing hers start to be answered. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about our prayer life, okay? But hers is already starting to be answered. I'll ask for three things, though, for our church family to pray for and agree on. One is that God will provide wisdom and clarity for us of how he wants us to manifest the gospel to our own neighbors right where we are, but also to the nations in the name of Christ. That's a, that's a big prayer request, but it's certainly one that he wants to answer uh, for us. The second is that God will provide the resources, human resources, so the people and the means to accomplish his will, and hopefully he'll, he'll use us in order to do that. So the, the message today and what we're going to read directly addresses that one. And then the third is that in God's timing, according to his will, that he'll produce and reap a harvest of souls, of men and women and boys and girls as a result of your faithfulness and our witness, wherever it is that he might plant 
and place us. When we're obedient to his plan, he'll produce a harvest. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So just personally, I would just ask you this today, and that is, what is that burden look like in your life so what's the greatest need right now you have in your life if you could just snap your fingers and one thing about your life or someone that you know would change in other words if you could ask God anything in all the world and you knew that he was going to grant your request no matter what it was what would that one thing be and again the promise is this by looking at God's Word today we're gonna see that God has already provided everything that you and I need, no matter what that need is. Now listen, there are no tricks. I promise you that God has already provided everything that we need. Now, in Nehemiah's day, they had wants and they had needs. And what they really needed, everybody, what they really needed was a spiritual awakening. And what God does in their midst and in their nation, we'll talk about some specifics, but what he does didn't happen all at once. Okay, so there were, there were many, many years involved in the awakening that they really did need. But God's going to address some things that they, they, they weren't as great a needs as that spiritual awakening, but they needed to happen in order for the Israelite people to get on board with what they really needed. And, the, and one of the things that they needed was this wall around the city because what had happened, just to review, if you haven't been a part of our study or maybe just to refresh your memory, what had happened was over now a couple of generations, these, um, the, the enemies from without had attacked Jerusalem and Judea and, and also though it was turmoil and idolatry from within. And now, as they looked around them, the city literally was in a pile of rocks. And people like Ezra and, and Zerubbabel and others came in, and they were rebuilding the infrastructure of that city. And now Nehemiah has traveled from 800 miles away with a small group of people, but resources from King Artaxerxes now to build up that wall again. And that wall and the infrastructure was going to be a part of that spiritual awakening. And oh, by the way, that wall included their homes. So back in their day, when there was a wall around a city, the outside wall would normally include their homes. So there would be a, there would be a home there, and then the wall on the outside would be actually a part of their house. So if there was a weak part in the wall, and the enemy found that weakness, guess where they would come in? Yeah, it would be right in your home. So that's where the people found themselves uh, as far as carrying out this project of rebuilding the wall led by Nehemiah. So what was happening here is God showing them grace, a lot of it, because they had compromised their faith. They were bowing down to these other idols and gods, and he was giving them another chance. How many of you all are thankful that we serve a God of second chances? And by the way, of third chances and fourth chances do I need to keep on going or is that about enough yeah that's the kind of God we serve and so that's what's going on here in chapter 5 of Nehemiah reality starts to set in because it's one thing when you're really excited about a new project and God is doing a new thing but you know what after the mundane and the plodding along starts you can get discouraged and so in chapter 5 the reality sets in of really the size and the, and the magnitude of this project, and they began to get discouraged. So just follow along with me in Nehemiah chapter 5, beginning of verse 1. He says, Now there was a great outcry of the people and other wives against their Jewish brothers. So this is not a foreign enemy. This is against fellow Hebrews. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore... Let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were others who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses that we might get grain because of the famine. Also, there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. 
Now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their children. Yet behold, you are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters are forced into bondage already. And we are helpless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. So what has gone on, uh, we're going to get down into the details of really what's happening in the next few minutes. But before we get there, let's just see the first part of this story. And that is God's response to a great need. God's response to a great need. What happens, first of all, wisely is that the people cry out. Nehemiah tells us there was a great outcry because there was a great need. Now the work, by the way, had stopped because of the great need. Before we get to what it is, though, think of the principle. Because over and over in Scripture, people in desperation cry out to God. And as they cry out to God, God hears their prayer and responds to them. In the book, in the, in the, uh, book of Exodus, the people of God are slaves in Egypt, and they cry out and cry out to God, and God sends them a deliverer in Moses. In the book of Judges, there's several cycles of the people in turmoil and trouble, and they cry out to God, and then God sends a judge, a deliverer, Gideon, Samson, Samuel. They cry out, and God responds. So I would say whatever your burden and whatever your need is today, begin by just crying out to God. And I'm not talking like just a little prayer before a meal. I'm talking about when the burden is so great that we cry out to God. I can promise you this, if the burden, if the pain gets great enough, you will cry out to God if you're smart, if you're a person of faith. Psalm 34, 6 says, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Even Jesus himself, as close as he was to the Father, God in the flesh, when the burden was great enough, he cried out to God. Matthew 27, 46, as he's on the cross, it says, In the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if Jesus, sinless, perfect Jesus, cried out to the Father, how much more is it wise for us to when we have a burden? Well, their needs were kind of unusual for this Um, for this individual, for this people anyway, because normally when they cried out to God, it was because of outside oppressors. But the language that Nehemiah uses in this passage is kind of strange because they're actually serving one another. So what's going on? Well, imagine all these people, possibly hundreds of thousands of them, coming into a city and what that would do with the, to the infrastructure of a city in terms of the need for food and, and water and everything, not even to speak of housing and protection and all of that. A couple of years ago, Paige and I were able to visit a country in the Middle East that has a population of about 4 million people. And there was another nation that had gone through a civil war, and so a million refugees, so 25% more people, had moved into this country and it was wreaking havoc on their resources and on their infrastructure. I can only imagine what it meant in this day. And so what was going on is people were, were, what they were, they were mortgaging their homes. They were, they were borrowing the money to pay taxes to Artaxerxes. Every time Artaxerxes sent resources, he was taxing the people more. And they were taxed and they were taxed. Plus there was a famine. And so there were some of their neighbors, some of their fellow Hebrew neighbors countrymen, they had enough resources to loan others, but they were charging these real high interest rates, this, this usury, as he calls it, we'll see in a few minutes, and it just put them in the poorhouse even more. And in their culture, their tradition was that if they, if they borrowed enough money, they could actually be in servitude until the money was paid back to whoever they borrowed it from. The problem was they had borrowed so much, they never could pay it back, and so the people never could buy their freedom back. And here we are. And I want you to see what Nehemiah's response is in verse 6. Then I was very angry when I had heard their outcry and these words. Well, hold on, Nehemiah. I thought you're a man of God. Is a man of God supposed to be angry? Oh, sometimes it depends on what motivates the anger. In 1980, a lady named Candy Leitner's daughter was killed by a drunk driver. She was angry. 
her friends, her family members, her network. And so she started an organization that was going to lobby Congress to change some laws, make the public more aware of the, 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 the danger of driving while intoxicated. And she even named the organization MAD. Mothers Against Drunk Driving. But that's channeling your anger in a way that's going to help. So it's not a sin to become angry at all, especially when we're, when we're indignant because of a wrong or because of a sin that's taking place or because of a, a pain that people are going through who were made in the image of God. We're image bearers, okay, made in the image of God. Yet Jesus said that, the, that Satan came to steal and kill and destroy and that's what he does and when that happens because we live in a world that's in a fallen state such as that even though jesus has came and purchased us with his blood we're still in a state where there's so much strife and sin and pain in the world and suffering in the world that we ought to look at that and it ought to make us angry certainly did jesus in mark chapter 3 there was a lot of there was, there was, there was some, some religious piety and hypocrisy around him. And um, in Mark chapter 3, he says, After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to a man, he man had a withered hand, and he said, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. So Jesus, even himself, would become angry as a result of the effects of sin, but it caused him to... To take, to take action. And, and in Nehemiah's day, specifically it, what it was is there are laws on the books. There were laws on the books in their Old Testament law that prohibited and forbid them to do exactly what they were doing. So one example of that is Exodus twenty two twenty five. 25. It says, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, and, you're, and you are not to act as a creditor to him, you shall not charge interest. Charge him interest. Deuteronomy 23, 19 says, You are not to charge interest to your countrymen, interest on money, food, or anything that may be loaned on interest. You may charge interest to a foreigner, but to your countrymen you shall not charge interest, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake in the land which you are about to enter to possess. By the way, that's not a mandate for you and me. He's writing specifically to their countrymen, their tribesmen, their the Jewish brothers and sisters. But this, they, they, he's prohibited exactly what they're doing, and they're doing it anyway. And by the way, this, this promise or, or, or this principle can translate to you and me, and that is, you know, Christians aren't called to live by the standards of the world. So just because something's okay or so or, or acceptable in one culture doesn't mean that just because something is legal doesn't necessarily mean it's right. And what's going on here is their love, God wanted and Nehemiah wanted their love for one another to be greater than their desire for money. And in Deuteronomy, that verse that I just read, it says, you know, you, you can charge interest and that's going to be your only reward. But if you don't, then God is going to bless you. And you'd rather have God bless you than just get a little money. And so in verse 7, he says, I consulted with myself. <laughs> that's a pretty strange thing to say, right? Nehemiah says, well, first of all, I consulted with myself. The language that's used there is he just, he just had, had his personal counsel. He, he reflected. He looked inward, first of all, and thought, what's the wise thing to do? And I want you to see what the result was. I consulted with myself and contended with the nobles and the rulers and said to them, you are exacting usury, that's high interest, each from his brother. Therefore, I held a great assembly against them. He just confronts them. And I said to them, we, according to our ability, have redeemed our Jewish brothers who were sold to the nations. He says, we just got people back that were in servitude to these other nations. Now... Would you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us? And then they were silent and could not find a word to say. Again, I said, the thing which you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? What he's, what he's concerned about is their witness. He says, these nations around us, they're watching what's going on in here. I would say the same thing to you and me. When a church is going through internal strife and turmoil, 
you can forget about any kind of witness outside the walls of that place. It just won't happen. And so he says, look, our enemies are watching us. And likewise, I, my brothers, and my servants are lending them money and grain. Please let us leave off this usury. Please give back to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also the hundredth part of the money and grain, new wine, oil. Verse 12. And then they said, we will give it back. And we'll require nothing from them. We'll do exactly as you say. So I called the priests and took an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. And then look what he says. I also shook out the front of my garment and said, Thus may God shake out every man from his house and from his possessions who does not fulfill this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. In other words, they agreed. They praised the Lord, and then the people did according to his promise. Okay, now there's a whole lot there, but let's dig into it. The bottom line is Nehemiah didn't just talk. They took action. So there's God's response to a great need, but he's basically said, look, I've given you. Here it is. I've already given you everything that you need. You need to obey me and be more concerned about how to treat one another and how the outside world sees you than just a little bit of money. And the second thing I want you to see is now our response to a great God. So God responds to a great need, and here's our response to a great God. Let me just go through a few things. They're in your notes there, okay? So the first one is to let's stop behavior that comes from a lack of faith. When there's sin in our life, it's very simple how God wants us to address it. He wants us to admit it, that's called confession, and quit it, that's called repentance. Okay? So we trust Him, and we admit those things, and then we repent. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. So, people... People who've been convicted by sin, okay, me, you, anyone else, just remember that when we're really convicted about sin, we don't stop gradually. It stops like that, and we repent. Now, you know what? Old habits may come back, but when it happens, we stop right then, we confess it, and we say, oh, God, I've fallen again, I've messed up again, but you know what? In Jesus' name. Because of your great mercy through him, would you forgive me once again? And then repent and start over. And remember, God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and sometimes even more. So stop behavior that comes from a lack of faith. Number two, start new behavior that honors God. Look at verse 11. He says, this very day. This very day. So if we're serious about repenting any time that we have sin in our life, then we'll take action, and that behavior is going to change. Number three, verbalize your commitment, and then keep your vow to the Lord. Verbalize your commitment, and keep your vow to the Lord. In verses 12 and 13, he says, look, this is what I'm going to do. And by the way, Nehemiah is not the exception. He's the example. Okay? So no, no Christian leader should expect that they're the ones that the rule of the principle doesn't apply to. We should be the example of that. And so he takes a vow, and he takes it verbally, and he makes them commit to the same thing. And, and they all do. And there are some pillars of truth that we ought to notice in this story too. And here they are. The first is, God always makes provision for his vision. He always makes provision for his vision. As a matter of fact, I've, uh, I've changed over the years of how I see this. And uh, part of it's because of just what is in God's word. And the other part is from, you know, my own experience too. The word provision, I used to think that, first of all, God gives this vision, and then when we work, and we toil, and we preach, and we trust, and we have meetings and get everybody on board, and then God provides for that vision. That's not the way it works. 
God gives everything that we need first. He's, an, he's a God of abundance. He's a generous God. He's not playing games with us. What does he need to keep resources for? He's given it all out here for us. We just have to be obedient to have a culture and a lifestyle of generosity and thanksgiving and holding things of this world loosely and clinging to Jesus tightly. Even the word provision, literally vision is to see, pro is before. So it's to, it's to see before something. So here's how it works. God, God sees the vision. He sees his vision of what he wants his kingdom and this world to look like. And he, since he knows that vision b- before the foundation of the world, he goes ahead and provides all the resources that are needed for that vision. And then it's up to you and me if we'll trust him, if we'll believe him. God sees what, we, what should be. And then before it is, he provides to make it happen. So he always provides for his vision. The second thing is the pillar of truth. God is honored when we handle possessions with integrity and generosity. And then third, unconfessed sin negatively affects our work, our effectiveness, and our joy. And let's not miss this fact from this story. While they're, while they're having all this turmoil with one another, the work, by the way, on the wall stops. No work's being done here. Part of it is that they had sold themselves into this indentured servitude, and they were working for one another, and there's not enough people evidently around to keep working on the wall. What I love about this story is when they're faced with what's really going on and they see it for what it is, they stop and they get back on board. And so I would just say this, Christian, son or daughter of God in Christ, don't hide or dodge sin in your life because it's much more painful and it's much more harmful than confessing and repenting. So let's talk about how to apply this very different and strange chapter from this book. Because in the coming days, everybody, God is going to provide more clarity. It's already starting to happen. God's going to give us direction. And there's going to be a time very soon, please listen now, there's going to be a time very soon that it's going to be time to act. And when that time comes... It'll be time to get busy, and we can't mess around because time's wasting. So we're not going to be able, as an individual or a church family, to do everything. But God's not called us to do everything, has he? That's, That's his department. He's the only infinite one. But we don't have to worry and be focused on getting it perfect. We just have to get it going. And sometimes being obedient to God is more about plotting, P-L-O-D-D-I-N-G, than it is plotting, P-L-O-T-T-I-N-G, because that's just sitting around and making plans. So let me share with you again some, some examples of the kinds of things that I believe the Lord seems to be calling us to do. We have so many people... And are going to continue to have people that are around us that face tragedies of some sort. This this community has been through that and will continue to. Just in the last few months and weeks, we've had about three different families that have been burned out of their homes. It's been so good to hear stories of how you've stepped up as their neighbors and friends and and come to their aid. And but. Many of these families will continue to need to be ministered to. And as a fellowship, we can do more together than we can individually. There are families all around of uh, uh, us that are coping with addictions from, from you know, pan- parents to, to, down to kids and grandparents, all, all, all ages, really. There are families that are caring for aging parents that are suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's that could use some support. There's families around us with children with special needs. And, you know, most families, although they're not intending to, or, or most, most churches will end up neglecting those 
families that have children with special needs because they don't think that they're equipped to handle the special needs that they have. And so those folks aren't involved in any church anywhere most of the time. They just stay home. There are families that are looking for healthy, wholesome, just healthy things to do as a family together, but it's, it's kind of hard to find those things to do in our world. Now, if it were, if it were me and, and I were listening to some of those things, I'm going to share with you my pushback because somebody here might be thinking about this. Somebody watching or listening to this may be having these thoughts. I would think, now hang on, man. Pastor, you know, there are, there are groups, there are nonprofits, there are organizations out there that do some of that stuff. And they can meet those needs, and they're equipped to meet those needs, and they have resources to meet those needs that I'm looking around, I just, I just don't see it. I just don't think that we have those resources. And there are other people out there that might meet those needs better. If that's what you're thinking, you're missing it. Because it's not about meeting the need. Okay? It's about providing hope in Christ in the midst of the need. That's what it's about. So the world, a lot of the world doesn't get this. They think it's just trying to alleviate, alleviate the need or the, or the pain point or the suffering. Are you kidding? That'll never happen this side of heaven. That'll never. Jesus is the one that said, you will always have the poor with you. But it didn't, he didn't stop the one that was pouring, washing his feet with her own tears from that expression of love. You will always have the poor. And Jesus wasn't saying, don't try to minister to those that are, that are in need. He did that all of his life, all of his ministry. And tells us to do the same. So that's the part, man, please don't miss that. It's not about trying to meet the need. It is true that anything that we do in the big scheme of things is only going to be a drop in the bucket. But that drop to the person who's, who has the need is a big, big drop. It's the hope in Christ that's missing. Hebrews 6.19 says, the hope, This hope we have is an anchor for the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. It's like that old story, you know, of the old man that's walking along the, the beach. There's been a big storm, and there are just thousands of these starfish that had washed up on the beach, and they're getting cooked by the sun. And somebody sees him, and he, he, he's going down one by one. He's picking up these starfish, and he's just zinging them back in the water. And the rest of them are just burning up. And the person says, man, what are you doing? And the old man says, I'm, I'm saving these starfish. And the cynical observer says, oh, man, you can't save all those starfish. It, it won't make any difference. And the man, without even looking up, just takes another starfish and flings it into the water. And he said, made a difference to that one. And he picked up one. He said, made a difference to that one. It made a difference to that one. Yesterday we attended a, a funeral service for a dear friend of ours. His name is Bobby Culpepper. Bobby Culpepper is one of the most passionate soul winners I've ever met. He was so in love with Jesus. Grew up not far from here, right in close to this, our community, worked at U.S. Steel about all of his adult life, and retired and actually came and, and joined, joined our staff and was an administrator and financial person for the church and almost, almost had another life after he took that early retirement from U.S. Steel. And he just began to live on mission and learn how to share his faith. And, man, he saw the first person pray to receive Jesus, and after that it was game over. And Bobby just talked about Jesus wherever he went. He was actually a double survivor of cancer. He'd had melanoma several years ago. And then just a few years ago, he received word that uh, he had lung cancer. And uh, after he found out, in fact, the doctors didn't give him long to live, a few months. And he ended up having several years. But when he didn't know but what he might meet Jesus very soon... Um, he and some friends were standing in the lobby of the church 
and uh, just gathered hands, and he shared this news. And uh, they ended up praying for Bobby. But when he shared that he didn't know how much longer he might live, here's what he said. He said, just think of it. One day, really, really soon, I might meet Jesus. And he, he, wasn't, he wasn't in denial. He wasn't just sticking his head in the sand. He really, really meant it. Because he had hope. A hope that was an anchor for his soul. See, because the greatest need that he had then, some people would say the greatest need that he had was chemo. greatest need that he had was radiation. The greatest need that he had was physical life, holistic healing. No, no. The greatest need that he had, he already had. He had Jesus. He was his greatest need. I'm going to share a statement with you that's absolutely true. Please write this down if it rings true. Where Christ abides, God provides. Where Christ abides, God provides. Romans 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we celebrate in hope of the glory of God. Not only this, but we also celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so what do you do? Whatever that one thing was, that thing that's burdening you, what do you do? Here's what you do. Here's how I know that God has provided everything that you need. Go as far as you can see and then trust God to move forward. Go as far as you can see and then trust God to move forward and go the rest of the way. I know that you want God to show you the whole path at one time. I know you do. Because I do too. God, you show me the path and I'll get on it. But guess what? That's not what God does. He doesn't show you the whole path. He shows you the next step. We walk by faith, not by sight. Think of the Hebrew people fleeing Pharaoh and the Egyptian horsemen and the chariots and there they are they got their back up next to a wall of the red sea what do they do they began to panic and they began to blame moses you let us out here and we're just gonna die and then god spoke to moses and said you tell the people to stand firm and trust me and then he told them to start walking there are some people, some Hebrew, some Old Testament scholars that believe that God didn't part the walls of the Red Sea all at one time. There are some who believe that he actually parted it gradually as they started walking across. One of them wrote, God never gives guides for two steps at a time. I must take one step and then I get light for the next. This keeps the heart in abiding dependence upon God. It's amazing how many times in Scripture the Bible says that God didn't provide or didn't, didn't give direction all at once, but day by day. In here in this book, Nehemiah 9.19 says, a pillar of cloud led them forward day by day. Psalm 42.8 says, day by day the Lord pours out his steadfast love upon me. Psalm 110.3 says, your strength shall be renewed day by day like the morning dew. 11, uh, Luke 11.3 11, Jesus himself says, Lord, give Give us this day, give us day by day our daily bread. Paul wrote, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. And sometimes that plodding along is better than just plotting to discover God's will. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, please. I want you to think about what God right now is doing in your life. 
And I want to do that by sharing with you the words to an old Christian song. It says, something beautiful. And the words go, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. He made something beautiful of my life. And while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you just think about your life and what it might be like without Jesus? If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to imagine. You're, you're living it right now. I want to tell you the good news. And that is, in Christ, God has provided everything, everything, to make something beautiful of your life as well. When you trust Him as Lord and Savior, would you do it? Would you do it today? Oh, I pray you will. It's really a difficult thing to do and to swallow our pride, but it's it's not really complicated. We admit to God that we've sinned, that we're far away from Him on our own, but that we trust in the work of Jesus on the cross, His perfect life, His sacrificial death, and then His glorious resurrection to save us from our sins. And the Bible says if we do that by faith, if we trust Him, then He'll hear our prayer come into our life save us and give us a new heart and a new spirit. Would you do it right there today? And whatever it is that you're burdened for, I want you to know that God has given us everything we need in Christ to meet that need. So why don't you thank Him? Ask Him to show you what He wants your next step to be by faith. Jesus, thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for this time and your word, for your promises. Help us now to be obedient as we trust you by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together, please. As morning dawns and evening fades, you today. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise. The invitation is over here, but the invitation is not over for you. Uh, if you'd like to talk this afternoon or during the week, uh, we would love the privilege and opportunity to be able to pray with you, to answer any questions.
we just want to see you be everything that God created you to be. Because when you do that, you're going to walk in victory and people around you are going to be blessed. Amen. Let's go out as we sing this song, the chorus to Chainbreaker. You got pain, he's a pain taker. Save him, well he's a pre-